this in mind because uh, one of the greatest things that Jesus accomplished on the cross was healing. Just the fact that you become born again is a healing. Are you here? And he healed us uh, 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 spiritually, physically, emotionally. He healed us here. Come on, somebody. Because when they plucked that crown of thorns into his head and all that blood was pouring, he was sanctifying our minds. That's why Paul was able to say, we have the mind of Christ, not we will. You're not here. The only reason he says we have the mind of Christ is not because we feel it. It's not because you figured it out. He says you have the mind of Christ because he paid the price. He took that crown of thorns and shed that blood and his head, they say, swelled to about five times his size. He was redeeming this, healing our mind. Amen? So, last Sunday, um, last Sunday we, we uh, talked about, you know, it was Palm Sunday, and that's what supposedly when the Holy Week started, and, and that's the time when uh, the, the people made a grand declaration of his lordship, right? That's when everybody understood, especially the Jewish people and the Pharisees, that's when they understood, wait a minute, this thing is getting momentum. And all these people are worshiping him now. Amen. That Monday, not much happened. I, the Bible doesn't talk about much. It was like a down day. Tuesday is on. Because Tuesday, he goes into the temple and starts turning over tables and throwing chairs. He started disrupting the system of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they did not like it. As long as he was talking and healing people, they can deal with that. But when he came and started coming against their system. Because in the temple, they, they had a racket. And they were doing, selling all kinds of stuff. And he, he came in. And he just disrupted everything. Can you imagine? And I don't know about you, but I think that that needs to happen today. I think that Jesus needs to come and start disrupting the religious system that many Christians that say they're not religious, but they are, and he will expose them. Amen. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they, from that point on, from Tuesday, they realized we need to take this guy out. We need to take him out. It says in, in okay, it's, it says in Mark 11, verse 27, get rid of that one. Mark 11, 27. Yeah, it says, then they came again to Jerusalem, and as, as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders came to him. Next verse. And they said to him, by what authority are you doing this, these things? And who gave you this authority to do these things? The next verse says. But Jesus answered. They, they didn't know they were messing with God. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and so what Jesus answered and said to them, I also would ask you one question. Then answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. The baptism of John, was it from heaven or from men? You know, sometimes we think we're very smart. Sometimes we think we're smarter than God. Really. Sometimes we try to reason with God from a human standpoint. And the Lord is like, well, you answer me this. I'm going to put it back on you. And if you can't answer me, then I'm not going to answer you. Come on, somebody. So he says, was it from heaven or from men? Answer me. Next verse says, and they reason among themselves, saying, if we say from heaven, he will say, why then did you not believe him? Next verse. Work with me. We're going to go through. But if we say from men, they feared the people for all counted John to have been a prophet indeed. So they didn't want to hear 
truth. They didn't want to hear what Jesus was saying. They were trying to manipulate him. And please, please, please hear my heart because I'm human just like you. And I deal with things just like you. But we can, we can read this and go like, those rascals. But if we're not careful, my friend, that's what we do. We try to reason with God. We don't, we don't accept what he's saying. We're trying to get around it because that's part of our old nature. And sometimes we don't get the answer we want because we're not willing. Oh, you're not hearing me. And he says, the next verse says, so they, they, so they answered and said to Jesus, we do not know. And Jesus answered and said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. There has to be a relationship of trust and of faith with God in order to hear from God. Because he could have easily told them, but he was withholding a revelation because they were unwilling to hear what he, to answer him and to answer his question about who they were and their motives. And sometimes we build a relationship with God that is not pure because listen to me very carefully, it is not about us. And this whole Holy Week is telling us that. It's, it's not about us. It's all about him. He's the Lord. He's the one that rules. That's why when they said, hey, in, in Palm Sunday, when, when they started throwing palms and saying, man, he's the Lord and all of this, that caught their attention because they were saying, wait a minute, somebody is higher than us. Come on. We ain't having it. We ain't, so we, let, we need to trick him. It's time that we take him down. But I got news for y'all. He is higher than us. He, he, we, I mean, the way he thinks and the way he do things. And Jesus came and started modeling who the father was. Don't play around. That's what he was telling them. Well, you, okay, I got a question for you. You answer my question, I'll answer yours. Was their question answered? No. And sometimes we leave our uh, uh, encounter with God without having our questions answered. Sometimes we say, Lord, why? Why is this? And he says, well, let me ask you. <laughs> why did you put yourself in that position? Beep. Conversation over. Because what he's trying to do is to cause them to get in touch with their inside, the inner man. Are y'all here? Wednesday, not much happened except that Judas was exposed as the one that would betray Jesus. Remember, I've, I've been talking about, um, I've been talking about the process and you know, all that kind of stuff. And we don't get it, man. Everything has a purpose. Everything that happens, ha you know, happens with a purpose. And here we go. You see this thing that's happening with Jesus. And everything has to happen. Because if it doesn't, just like the, uh, they, they, are, they have a, um, a new uh, show on Netflix. Yeah, I watch Netflix. So go ahead, judge me if you want me, if you want to. And it's on Moses, right? And then they're talking about Moses and how he was in, in Egypt. We know this. I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, yes, I know the story. But it's good to see it, right? Visual. And, um, and so how he turned around. I mean, he was saved, right? And then uh, he turns around and sees. He, he's way up here now. But he sees uh, an Egyptian beating up an Israelite. And he goes, he couldn't take it no more, so he kills the Egyptian. And then we go like, why did that have to happen? It had to happen. I'm not advocating murder. I'm just saying that this was, this was the thing that had to happen in order for him to leave Egypt. And if that wouldn't, hadn't happened, he wouldn't have left Egypt. And if he wouldn't have left Egypt, he wouldn't end up, in, in, you know, uh, 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 out in the desert. And seeing the burning bush. And sometimes we trip and we freak out. Lord, why is this happening? Just wait for it. 
I got a purpose. Just keep looking to me. And, and if you need a burning bush, I'll give it to you. Come on. And, and the reason, my friend, that so many people have a hard time with their Christianity is because they're trying to fix it all the time. Lord, have mercy. I'm going to fix it one way or another. I'm going to fix it this way. I'm going to fix it by worrying. I'm going to fix it by, you know, by, by being angry. I'm going to fix it by taking my stand. I'm going to fix it by doing whatever I have to do. And the Lord says, slow down. I have a purpose for you. And if you look to me and you understand that even my son had a, 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 a process that he had to go through, Amen. Hallelujah. Watch this. John 13, verse 21. Jumping. It says, when Jesus had said these things, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, most assuredly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. Then the disciples looked at one another perplexed about whom he spoke. Now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. And again, let me stop there because I shared this before. It's worth sharing it again. We need to understand that Jesus, listen to me, he loved everyone, but he loved John more. (gasps) But that makes no sense. No, 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 no. It's reciprocal. John would lay on his bosom. John was close to him. And Jesus wanted that. Because that's the type of relationship he wanted. He didn't want a relationship where, you, where people were way out there. Say, hey, hey, hi, Jesus. Woo, you're good. Nice miracle. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. No, no, no. He wanted a closeness. And, and that's what John gave him. While everybody was doing stuff, John was in his bosom, on his lap, knowing that he is the Lord. And, and so he tells us the one whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter therefore motioned to him to ask who it was of whom he spoke. Then leaning back on Jesus' breast, he said to him, Lord, who is it? Now stop there a minute. Because Peter could have asked Jesus. But Peter didn't have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And sometimes, my friend, we're, we're afraid to ask the Lord things. We'd rather go to somebody which we perceive is more spiritual. What is the Lord saying? Well, y'all wish y'all were here. So Peter, he knows, he knows that John is real intimate. Hey, who's he talking about? Ask him. And then John just says it. He said to, to him, Lord, who is it? And he felt he can ask him because he had relationship. Do you realize that sometimes the last person that we talk to is the Lord when we have an issue? And he is saying, man, I died for you. I rose again for you. I shed my blood for you, for you. And he knows us by name. He said, I've done this for you. Why you got to be asking somebody else? Ah, that's why when, when he said, hey, who do people say I am? Well, they say you're Elijah, and you're saying this and that. No, no, no. Okay, but who do you say I am? He made it personal. He made it personal. I know what they're saying, and they got it wrong. But what are you saying? Do you have enough relationship with me to know who I am? Come on. Mm. next verse Jesus answered it is he to whom I shall give a piece of bread of when I have dipped it and having dipped the bread he gave it to Judas Iscariot the son 
of Simon. Are you all here? Now after the piece of bread, Satan entered him. Then Jesus said to him, what you do, do quickly. And I know that that trips some of y'all out. Jesus, Jesus uh, 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 John says, and Satan entered him, and that freaks us out. Because like, how can Satan enter somebody? Well, you look it up in the Hebrew, it's not exactly entered. It's almost like an, he opened the door. Because the fact of the matter is that he was already doing wrong and he was skimming off the top. He was robbing money from Jesus. You know, you're here. I mean, his heart was not right to begin with. And plus, people can't say, well, how can, how can Satan enter if God was in him? He was not. That happened at the resurrection of Jesus. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Thank God. But he didn't have that. He had a false relationship with God. Come on. And so he was taking from him. And the amazing thing is that the Lord knew it all the time. But he, Lord, nobody understands the process better than Jesus. And he said, even though he's stealing from me. And even though I know he's going to betray me, I'm going to still wash his feet. You're not here. Because he is part of my process. And sometimes we determine what our process is. It's going to be my way or the highway. Come on. And, and yet we have a relationship with God. And yet we're believers and we accepted what, him whenever we did. And, and some people don't feel saved, but they are. Because the day they accepted the Lord, they are saved. And they can't undo that. Come on, somebody. Are we okay? Thursday. Today. On Thursday, starts the Passover. In Luke 22, verse 7, yay. It says, then came the day of unleavened bread when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John saying, go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat. So they said to him, where do you want us to prepare? And he said to them, behold, when you have entered the city, a man will meet you carrying a pitcher of water. Follow him into the house which he enters. Talk about process. And do you realize that God is detailed? Do you realize when God spoke to Moses and told him to build a temple, he gave him Everything exactly the way that it had to be done to the T. We serve a precise God. He knows what you're going through. And he knows where he's leading you. And he knows what happens. I mean, here he's telling them, well, well how, where are we going to do it? Well, you're going to go in here and you're going to see this person and so on and so forth. Next verse says, then you shall say to the master of the house, the teacher says to you, where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Then he will show you a large furnished upper room. There make ready. So they went and found it just as, just as he said to them and they prepared the Passover. So this is Thursday, coming into Friday. And he is showing them what's about to happen. The Passover meal represented the Passover back in, in the, the days of Moses when, when they were killing all the, right? The angels were killing all the, the, the firstborn men and they had to put the blood. Come on. 
And all of this is leading up. It's been prophesied. Uh, Jesus is telling them over and over again what's going to happen. But in their minds, they can't put it together. Because they'd rather be with Jesus. Come on, somebody. John said, Behold the Lamb that takes away the sin of the world. He understood. John the Baptist had a revelation that he was the Passover Lamb that had to be killed and that had to shed blood. None of this happened. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus, he, Jesus said, he said, no one takes my life. I lay it down. So they thought, man, we got him now. Uh-uh. Listen, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7 says, Therefore purge out the old leaven, the old covenant, that you may be a new lump, new covenant, since you truly are unleavened, for indeed... Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Bro, we cannot take any, at all, no credit whatsoever. No credit whatsoever for our salvation. No credit whatsoever for, uh, for the favor that he, that he has given us and the grace that he has given us. It happened all because he decided to give his life and shed his blood for the remission of sins. And our lives should be a life of thanksgiving. Lord, thank you. Because don't you remember how it used to be before Christ, B.C., in our lives. Don't we remember that the only reason we came to Christ because that was a terrible life. And, 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 and we couldn't even go to nobody. Whether it was depression or oppression, whether it was sickness, whether it was addiction, whatever the case may be, my friend, we realize I'm going to die this way. And Jesus said, you will not die. You will live. And do you realize that we spend most of our time, probably 80% of our time, complaining about our lives instead of worshiping him and thanking him? Because when we do that, my friend, everything starts happening. Happening, All the promises start, start coming. And you start realizing the mind of Christ. And you start realizing that the inner man is stronger than the outer man. But we would never understand that because we're too busy trying to protect the outer man. Matthew. 26, 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread, blessed it and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. All this is happening within days. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sins. My friend, we are new covenant people. We're not old covenant folks. New covenant people think different. They operate different because they realize they're not under the old covenant or the old contract. The old contract said, whatever you do, you're going to pay. Whatever, I mean, you, this is going to happen and that's going to happen. And Jesus said, in my blood, it's a new covenant. It's a covenant of grace and love. Hey, thank you. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Amen. Praise the Lord. Friday is the day.
Matthew 26. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane and said to the disciples, sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. They they were the baddest ones, I have to say it. No, they were. Those were the bad ones, man. I mean bad in a good sense. You know, the sons of thunder and Peter, he'll cut somebody's ear off in a minute, you know. And so he took them, it says, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed, and there it is. The Bible says that we serve a high priest that can relate to every single thing that we we go through. And sometimes we go to the Lord thinking like, Lord, you don't even know what I'm going through. Come on. I'm talking about relationship. Everything that I'm talking about here from, from, from that happened from Sunday to Friday is all about relationship. Amen. Next verse says, Then he said to them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Next verse. He went a little farther and further and and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And sometimes, you know, we think, Lord, you, you don't know what I'm going through. Yes, he does. Because he, he, he went through it so bad. That the Bible says he sweated blood. His depression was so bad that he just said, you know what, man? Father, I'm, I'm willing to give up this plan. This is too much. This is too hard. I can't do this, but it's not about me. And this, that's the key. That's the key, y'all. When you feel like you can't do it anymore, then you know what? Then turn it over to him. You know, because at some point, my friend, if you don't give up your will, then you will destroy yourself from depression and all those things. And so he said, Man, I can't take it. But nevertheless, not as I will, because this is really not about me. This is about you, Father. It's about your will. Amen. Praise the Lord. Then he came to the disciples and found them what? Sleeping and said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Listen to me. He is at his worst. He is suffering. The oppression, depression was so bad. And he's looking for friends. He comes to his friends, and you're asleep. Well, you know, I'm asleep because, doggone it, man, it's like 3 o'clock in the morning. (laughs) You know, I'm asleep. I understand, I understand what you're going through, but, man, I'm just tired. (laughs) You're not here. Come on. Then the Bible says, I think you go back. Did I finish? The last verse. They were sleeping and he said to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me? What? One hour. He wasn't even saying, oh, but come on, man. Give me like six hours. You know, like I get impressed with people who say, I, I, I prayed eight hours. Well, praise the Lord, man. <laughs> you know. And, and so I'm not going to feel bad because he loves me just as much as you. And I only prayed for half hour. But, but having said that, there's, he has a closer, perhaps, relationship, more intimate, right? So they, they, just, they just fell asleep on him. It says, then, then, next verse says, watch and pray lest you enter into what? Temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. 
So what he was saying was, man, be aware. Because there's times that some great things are about to happen. And even though I was suffering, the next step is the freedom of your life. And you're sleeping. Because today, my friend, we may not be literally sleeping, but we're sleeping. God is trying to do something, and we don't have any idea of what he's doing or what he wants to do. Why? Because we're sleeping. We're in a stupor. Do you think this is kind of rough tonight? (laughs) It's intentional. It's got to be rough. Look at what Jesus went through, man. And we, we take that too lightly. Look at the price he paid for you and I. And sometimes we're like, uh, and, and, you know, that's why sometimes, you know, we, it's a covenant of grace. But some people, my friend, they use grace to just not even have a relationship with God. And, 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 and grace without a relationship does not work because he is grace personified. Grace is not a thing. It is a person. And people will have a relationship with grace apart from grace personified, the person. Can't do it. We can't do it. Again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, Oh, my father, if this cup cannot pass away from me unless I drink it, your will be done. And he came and found them what? Asleep again. For their eyes were heavy. Hmm. So he left them, went away again, and prayed the third time. Saying the same words. I mean, he was now trying to negotiate with the Father heavily. He didn't give up the first time. He said, let me try again. Maybe the Father changed his mind. Didn't happen. Yo, guys. Jeez, help help a brother out. You don't see what I'm going through? Goes a third time. Says the same thing. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. You know who it was. Today's Christianity, guys, since I travel, I get a taste of stuff. You know, I go to Africa, I go to Burma, I go to Latin America, and and the intensity of their relationship. Because every time I went to Africa, and man, my boy is doing great. Pastor Joseph, I mean, he started out, I, this is no lie, like in a little cave. He had about five people in that cave, but they were having church. Now he has a huge church, man, reaching all kinds of folks. But the first service that I went to, they started worship. And so I got into it because they're very lively, man. They got all kinds. And I'm, and, and about half hour, I'm thinking they're about ready to stop because that's what we do. Oh, you ain't here. I mean, we, we have that clock, right? Oh, they're going to worship half hour and then they do the offering. And then, so I'm waiting. So, man, they go over 45 minutes and nobody's saying nothing. They just jumping up and down. Some of them were running around the church. And I'm like, huh. so I started off real. An hour and a half later, I'm thinking, <laughs> but the intensity and their, their, their love for God. And I was thinking, we, we're missing it in the U.S. We're missing it. So honestly, can I be honest with you? After all, this is real life church. 
I felt like they were torturing me. Two and a half hours later, they were still. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, Lord. And it was like 100 degrees. No air. And then they finally turned it over to me. And guess what? I preached for about three hours. I'm serious. Sweat coming down. I, pre I said, you, I'm going to make you pay now. <laughs> and some of them were falling asleep. I'm like, oh, now, huh? Because I can go. Y'all don't know. I can go. I mean, you, you, I'll keep you here three hours preaching. I promise you. So somebody is saying, not tonight. <laughs> I heard you. Amen. <laughs> so that's what happened. You, he, they came. They arrested him. Right? They go. Uh, a pilot uh, gets involved. And then that's when they decided to receive Barabbas instead of Jesus. They said, well, hey, once a year we do this. We, would you tell us we'll let go one prisoner? Jesus did nothing but do the work of the Father. And the people started shouting, Barabbas, Barabbas. You know why? Because Barabbas was a criminal. Barabbas fought against the Romans. You all hear But Jesus did nothing. And they thought, with Jesus, all we're going to get is love. With Barabbas, we might overturn the Roman government. You're not here. That's why I don't believe this take it by force nonsense. I mean, we, I grew up in spiritual warfare. Take it, you got to take it by force. He didn't. And we're his children. We don't take nothing by force. Come on, somebody. When they saw him come uh, uh, on Palm Sunday, when they saw him come on that donkey, they thought, what the world is this? We thought he was going to come in a white horse letting the Romans know it's over. And now, they take him to Golgotha, the place of the skull. In the, in the Greek, they call it cranium. Spanish would call it cranio. Almost the same. The place of the skull. Why did they t take them there? Again, everything has a purpose. In Matthew 27, verse 33, it says this. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, that is to say, the place of a skull, they gave him sour wine mingled with gall to drink. But when he tasted it, he would not drink because that was known that they would give it to anybody that, that is crucified or have been whipped, that was like a sedative to them. That would ease the pain, and he refused to take it because he wanted the full force of man's sin upon him. He didn't want to cheat it out. He didn't want to say, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, give me some more. When he tasted it, he spit it out. He said, I don't need that nonsense. I don't need to medicate what God called me to do. Well, I wish y'all would hear me. And then they put him up with two robbers. And this is so important because the Bible highlights those two robbers. The bottom line is that that they had a purpose there as well because they were, they were symbolic of Adam and Satan. 
One robbed Adam of his identity. The other, the other one robbed the father from his fatherhood. Because when Adam ate of the fruit, he ran and, and, and did not act like a son at all. He ran like an orphan. I wish I were here, man. And that's what an orphan does. He runs from the father. And it's funny, we're going to read it because it says in Luke 23, are we good? Don't, don't mess around because back in the day on Friday, you all be up all night. <laughs> now at church, huh? And some of us are cool. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> Not cool enough because I've been there. So it says, then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him saying, if you are the Christ, and that is the very same verbiage that Satan used with Jesus in the desert. Remember? If you are the son of God, if you are the son of God, here again, he's using it while he's on the cross. Because the Bible says that after Jesus did not give into his mess in the wilderness. It says, and Satan left for an opportune time, and this was it. He figured you at your worst. You're hurting. You're bleeding. People have left you. Your own friends have left. Your own family abandoned you. You at your worst. This is my opportune time. If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. In other words, he was, like it says, he was blaspheming. Next verse says, but the other answering rebuked him saying, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, and we, in, and we, in, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Next verse says, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, For surely I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And the whole idea, my friend, of when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, and we know that's not true physically. But the day that Adam got crucified with Christ, we all were crucified with him. Are y'all here? You need to think about this. And I love, I love what happened here. Because the, this robber was not baptized. This robber uh, 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 didn't, uh, you know, do anything. To deserve that, because you know how it is. Religious said, well, you got to be baptized, and you got to do this, you got to do that to be saved. No, no, no. All you need is faith in the master. And that's what he said. Remember me. Come on. And then he tells them, today you will be with me in paradise. The word paradise in the Greek is garden. We're going back, Adam. I'm restoring you. To the original place that I called you. And that's what happens when you and I accept Christ. He restores us as sons and daughters. Blameless. Righteous. But it's too much for us to take. That's where faith comes in. No matter what you've done, my friend. In the eyes of the father, you're still a son. You're still a daughter. Even if you don't feel it. Even if you have not done all the right things. And he's, 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 I'm, <laughs> you are who he says you are. And here we go. And then we're going to pray. Because as I said, this whole thing is about healing. 
And I've been praying and believing God for healing this day. Whether it be physical, emotional, spiritual healing, my friend, we need it. And the Bible says that Jesus went around healing everybody. He healed everybody. It's because of the atonement on the cross. The word atonement means exchange. He took all the sin of the world that we may be free. He took upon himself all the sickness and disease so that by his stripes we may be healed. And that's why I took time to share with you everything that happened because he was bringing it to that place. It had, it had been prophesied in Isaiah 53 for everything. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for what? Our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are. Now we will be, my friend. We are healed. Peter picks it up in the New Testament and says the same thing. Remember, by his stripes we are healed. Now we'll be because he did this 2,000 years ago. And our faith says that, that, that what he did 2,000 years ago is valid today. All I have to do is have faith. And some of us need healing and we don't even know it. You know, I remember I got fever and whatever. And... Um, Man, oh man, I felt terrible, but, but Pastor Normo is taking care of me. Soup, this, that, you know. And when you're sick, man, you know, we're like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I started feeling better. And I thought, hmm, if I tell her I'm better, she'll stop the treatment. And I'm saying this, saying that to say this, sometimes we're afraid to be healed because we find comfort in the condition that we're in. Because the minute that I would have told her, I feel better, well then go on, take out the garbage. Oh, you're not here. And I don't want the responsibility. I'm going to play sick for a little while longer. And that is, my friend, where we need healing here. And Jesus said, and I'm closing with this, and then we're going to pray. And if you are willing to believe God for healing and deliverance this day, this Good Friday, you will receive it. Because it is the job of the Holy Spirit to manifest his word. And the Holy Spirit, my friend, is in you whether you feel him or not. Whether you talk to him or not. He's in you. And Jesus said in Luke 4.18. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, and this is where, my friend, inner healing comes in. Because we may not be sick physically, but we have been bruised, and we have been brokenhearted. And he says, I'm going to cover it all. He says, I'm going to heal that broken heart, if you would allow me. I'll heal the pain of rejection. I will heal the things that nobody can see because they are inside. I will heal what happened to you years ago 
that you have not been able to let go is because you need inner healing. You need to be healed inside. And that's why he said that he will heal the brokenhearted. To proclaim liberty to the captives and recover your sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. Yes, he wants to heal depression and oppression. This is what he did. This is why he was the lamb that shed his blood. Do you think that he did it just so that we can say, I'm saved? I'm saved. When did you get saved? Oh, for me, 1979. Woo, that's a long time. No, 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 no. Yes, I understand that is my position. But I need help with my condition. Because even though I'm saved, I'm still hurting. Even though I'm saved, I can't trust. Even though I'm saved, I, I got have anger. Even though I'm saved, and, and, and the Lord says, listen, I didn't die for you just to, so that you can miss hell. I died for you so that you can be healed outside and inside. And if we don't see that, my friend, Good Friday means nothing. What he did on the cross means nothing. If we don't put a demand by faith on what he did on Calvary, then we're missing it. It's great to be healed physically. I'm believing for that tonight. But it's a super blessing to be healed inwardly and you know if you need it or not because you have to realize that every time that you feel like you want to give up and every time that you feel anger and all that kind of stuff is because you need inner healing and tonight we can have it all And the reason I share what I shared because I wanted you to build your faith to believe that tonight what he did on Calvary is for us right here and right now. And why wouldn't we want it? Depression is a killer. We don't need it. We want to be healed. So I want you to stand to your feet, guys. And I knew I was going to take some time tonight, but it doesn't matter. Because what matters is you. He died for you. He died for me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you for moving in our midst and touching our hearts. Tonight could have just been a nice message on, on you on the cross and in a few days you rose again. But you did it for us if we don't realize that you did it for us. And you know exactly what we're going through. You know exactly what we're going through because you know us better than ourselves. And you see the pain, and you see the depression, and no pressure, you see it all. And you go like, man, as a father, I feel for you. That's why I died for you. But tonight, you have to want it. You have to want to be healed. You have to want to be free. He paid the price. And if you have the faith to be healed tonight, if you're willing to let go of something that can, can become a crutch. Because when Jesus went by the pool of Bethesda, he found a man that couldn't walk. And he asked him this question. What do you want? My friend, don't you see me? 
Don't you see my condition and you're going to ask me what I want? And that's because Jesus wanted him to make the decision to be whole. Are you here? Do you want pity? Do you want somebody to help you? What is it that you want? And I believe that's what Holy Spirit is saying tonight. If you want it, it's yours. But you have to have the faith to want it and receive it. So if that's you, we're going to take a moment, guys. It's Friday night. I wish more people were here, but listen, man, when they watch on YouTube or whatever, they're going to be set free too. And God forbid that somebody watches, gets healed and free, and you're here, and you don't avail yourself to it. So by faith in the name of Jesus, if you want healing, I want you to come up here. Come on. This is why he did it. We are responding to what he did. We're not responding to a man. We're responding to what he did. If you need freedom, if you need healing, and let me put it this way, maybe you have someone in mind that's not here, then you come up for them. Stand in proxy for them. And Jesus, and Jesus, the Christ, the one who shed his blood, who took the beating that no one else can ever take, took those stripes for you, for you. He knew that you would be here this night. He, he knew that you would be doing what you're doing and, the, and, and being in the condition that you're in. He knows it all. And if you can hear his heart, how much it hurts him that we would hurt the way we do when we don't have to. He says he became poor that we may become rich. He took on our sin so that we can be free and forgiven. He took those stripes so that we may be healed. He did that for us. He did it for us. So I want you to raise your hands before the Lord. You realize His presence is here ever so strong. This must become a good Friday for the rest of our lives. And Father, I thank you right now. You're the only one that can touch a heart. You're the only one, Father, that can bring inner healing of, of past pain and past hurts. You're the only one, Father, who can change the way we think about things. You're the only one that can do it, and you have. And now it's our turn to receive what you've done for us in the name of Jesus by faith in the living God we receive Father your love, your grace your healing physically your healing emotionally your healing mentally your healing spiritually we receive it now in the name of Jesus and Father we thank you that again, it is not by might nor by power, but by your spirit. And we are saying, Spirit, Holy Spirit, move now. Move now in our hearts. Move now in our minds. Father, bring healing, Father. We've been longing for healing. It's been too long. And we want, Father, to walk in the free, in the free liberty that you have given us. Let him do it because he's moving right now and he's touching you where no one else can touch you. No one else can touch you there but him. 
He is our God. Let him touch you. Bringing healing to that situation. He's bringing healing to, to when you were young and, and things happened with your parents and, and things happened with family. He's healing that right now. Is healing the, the hurt that has come upon you because you felt like you did not live up to his standards. And he's healing that right now in the name of Jesus. Move by your spirit, Lord. Move by your spirit. Guys, I want you just to give it to him. You know it. You know what it is. Just give it up to him. Give it up to him. Dare to give it up to him. Whatever it is, give it up to him in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We honor you tonight. Thank you for dying on the cross. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. Thank you, Lord, that you did it for us. And Lord, we thank you that you sealed it with your resurrection. And by this Sunday, when we come to church, we're going to be different. We're going to walk like healed people. We're going to walk like forgiven people. We're going to walk like resurrected people. Father, in the name of Jesus, it will not be the same ever again. And when we come, we're not only going to hear about resurrection, we're going to live resurrection. The power of resurrection. So Lord, I thank you. Because your work does not stop here. And when this service is over, it's just the beginning. Because you're going to keep healing us and keep touching us tonight. And we thank you for it. Now, will you take a moment and just thank the Lord? Just thank him. Just thank Jesus. Thank him. Thank him. And this is what he's saying. The Lord is saying this, if you take your eyes off of yourself and put it on me, I will continue to heal and change situations in your life that you thought were impossible. And whenever you think of thinking about you more than me, Holy Spirit will remind you of this night and he will let you know, leave it alone Look to the Lord and let him do what he wants to do. Your journey, my friend, your journey is of God. God is in your journey. He is there. He's the rock that followed them in the wilderness. And he's the rock that, will, that is following you every step of the way. And though you, though you may not feel him, he's there. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. Do you think that he went through everything he went through to then abandon you? No. He's with you. He is with you. Give the Lord again a good thanksgiving offering. <laughs> Father, we thank you. We thank you. And we declare in the name of Jesus that Satan has nothing on us. Because Christ in us, the hope of glory. Father, we thank you that we are righteous. Father, we thank you that we are the beloved. We thank you that we are the apple of your eye. And Lord, we thank you that we are here, Father, to lift you up and to honor you. And to be a witness of your grace and love to others. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Praise the Lord. Give the Lord a good clap offering, guys. Listen, it is Good Friday, so get happy.